Isla and Mia were destined to be friends. They were born within months of each other and their families moved to the same friendly seaside suburb of Sydney and they lived just a block apart. They would go on to go to the local primary school and their families would become friends. This should have been an uneventful tale of childhood in the suburbs and it would have been if not for two tiny events, genetic mutations that may have occurred generations before Mia and Isla were even born. Mia was diagnosed with Batten's disease a month before Isla was diagnosed with San Filippo syndrome. These are disorders that are caused by a single genetic fault and they interrupt the biological pathways of the children's bodies. Now I could go into a lot of detail about enzymes and proteins and the cellular impact of these disorders but I won't because that actually doesn't matter. What matters is how these disorders present in the children. What matters is how the families that love them and the communities that surround them are impacted. Because Batten's disease and San Filippo syndrome are most accurately described as childhood dementia. If ever there were two words that shouldn't go together, it was childhood and dementia. Everybody's familiar with dementia and the devastating effects it can have. Most families have been touched by dementia at some point. My own grandfather succumbed to Alzheimer's disease. It was a dreadful thing to watch. So imagine taking all of that and bundling it up into the body of a small child. A child who hasn't had time to build their memories before they are lost. A child who is still developing the skills that are going to be taken. A child whose mind is ravaged, body is broken and voice is silenced before it's even heard. And when Isla and Mia's family received this diagnosis six years ago, they received an accompanying message. There's nothing you can do. Take your child home and love them. Enjoy the time that you have. Their lives will be short and the quality will be terrible. This was the most heartbreaking day of these families' lives. I know because I was there. I know because I'm Isla's mum. And just when I thought things couldn't get worse, they suddenly did. You see, the way these conditions typically present is that the early days, they're not present. Kids are born seemingly healthy. In the first couple of years of life, they hit all of their early milestones. They get to about two or three and you start to see some signs, but they're very subtle. Typically, a parent might notice a speech delay in their child or some behavioural issues. But they're two or three. It's not uncommon to see those kids in children, those things in children. Some families take years going on a diagnostic odyssey before they receive the answers that they're looking for. And in those years, life goes on and families grow. And this was the case in both Isla and Mia's situation. These mirror image families had both added little brothers to the mix. Mia's little brother Toby was tested for battens and he was cleared. He had won the genetic lottery. Isla's little brother Jude wasn't so lucky. A month after I received Isla's diagnosis, I also received Jude's. And my world tilted on its axis. It never, never looked the same. So what do you do? There is no protocol. This wasn't in any of the parenting books that I'd read. I still don't know how I was supposed to respond, but I can tell you how I did respond. The doctors told me that there was nothing I could do, that I shouldn't have false hope, that I shouldn't go chasing around the world looking for a cure. But I looked at my little babies and I knew I couldn't listen to that. I had to challenge them. And so I started reading and educating myself on San Filippo and all of the research that was happening. 
And I talked to a lot of people, anybody that would listen, doctors and researchers and other families and pharmaceutical industry experts, and I discovered two really important things. The first thing I discovered was that science was a lot more progressed than we originally realised. And there was three or four programs that were looking to head into clinical trial. And that was fantastic news. But all of those programs and all that research was happening overseas. And there wasn't an opportunity for children here to access it. And the second thing I discovered was that all of that research had happened because families like mine had driven it. There isn't a commercial imperative for pharmaceutical companies to invest in technologies for rare disease. And so when I understood those two facts, I realised there was really one thing to do, and that was to join the fight. And so I started the San Filippo Children's Foundation, and our very first project was uh, partnering with a biotech, a US-based biotech, to deliver a gene therapy clinical trial. Now, a year before, if you'd told me about gene therapy, I would have thought you were telling me, you know, the, the plot of a science fiction novel. It's incredible. These researchers had taken a virus and inserted into that virus a healthy copy of the gene that's faulty in children with San Filippo. They then intended to infect the bodies of these children with this virus and the virus would deposit its genetic cargo into the cells of their body, including the brain, which is a notoriously difficult organ to get therapeutics to. So we were very excited and we went ahead and the biotech, as part of our agreement, agreed to set up a clinical site here in Australia, one of just three globally, the other being US and Spain. And I'm very pleased to say that the very first child was treated on that clinical trial in July of 2017. And since then, our foundation has gone on to fund 18 different research projects and direct six and a half million dollars into research for San Filippo. And a lot's changed in the Batten's world in that time too. There is now a drug for Mia's strain of Batten's. If she were diagnosed today, not only would she be offered this drug, but it would be fully funded by the Australian government on the Life Saving Drugs Program. The process and the time that it took to get that drug through the regulatory bodies and into the hands of the children who need it was unprecedented. It was incredibly short. And that was due to a sustained advocacy program that had been run by Mia's family and other families like hers. Mia's mum, Peter, started a movement, Bounce for Batten. It's been embraced by thousands of people around the world and around the country. And on International Batten's Awareness Day every year, people post photos of themselves bouncing on their social media platforms with the hashtag Bounce for Batten. Bouncing is fun and it's something every child should be able to do and it creates positive energy. These are gorgeous portraits of joy, as Peter describes them. And this campaign really brought Batten's into the mainstream and the most incredible and unexpected people have bounced, including the Honourable Julie Bishop, uh, Dr Chris Brown and his cat, and the Wiggles. <laughs> so I'm very proud of all that we've achieved. It's fantastic. This really is parent power. But we still have a lot to do. Yes, there's a drug now for Mia's strain of Batten's, but there's 12 other subtypes of Batten's for which there is no treatment. There's still no treatment for San Filippo. And there are many other rare childhood dementias for which there is no treatment, or if there is a treatment, it's not good enough. And so we've still got a lot of work to do. Canavan disease, Neiman Pick, adrenoleukodystrophy, some of the mitochondrial disorders, the list goes on and on. All of these childhood dementias are rare when you look at them individually. San Filippo, for example, has less than 100 children in Australia. But collectively, they're not rare. So I can't help but wonder, what if? What if we were able to leverage what we've achieved for San Filippo or for Batten's into these other childhood dimensions? What if researchers had infrastructure and funding that allowed them to consider these disorders as a collective 
with similar presentation and similar disease mechanisms. And they could try si different approaches across multiple disorders. What if the people who invest in research, the donors and the, and the supporters, could get more bang for their buck by seeing the application of their dollar go that much further? What could we learn about those rare single genetic fault disorders that could help inform the more complex and common disorders like Alzheimer's? So this is the kind of thing that keeps me awake at night and I'm obviously very driven for answers. Um, but the other thing I'm passionate about, and tonight is a, is a youth event, so it's important for me to give you one message and if there's only one thing you walk away from tonight remembering, it's this. At the other end of the spectrum, there is something that you can do to avoid diseases like San Filippo and Batten's. If I were considering having a child today, there is so much more information available to me in that process. I believe it's everybody's right to understand their genetic risk and the risk that they face as a couple in order to make decisions about their future children. If I were having a child today or thinking about having a child today, I could order a genetic testing kit. My non-invasive saliva sample would be sent back to the health provider. They would analyse the data that came out of that saliva sample and a professional genetic counsellor would set up a Skype session to talk to me about the results. Had I had the opportunity to do this, that genetic counsellor would have explained that my husband and I were both healthy carriers of San Filippo and that any pregnancy that we had had a one in four chance of resulting in a child with the condition. Had we known about that risk, we could have mitigated it. We could have used reproductive technology like IVF to avoid the condition entirely. We could have had healthy children and our lives would have been entirely different. There's also a program that the government have initiated called Mackenzie's Mission which will test 10,000 couples over the next two years for 500 different genetic conditions. And we hope from that that we see population-wide carrier screening within our lifetime so that families can avoid the heartache that we have. And you actually may be quite aware of carrier screening. The Jewish community have led this field for many years and there's a very interesting case study of a disorder called Tay-Sachs uh, which incidentally is also a childhood dementia, where the incidence over 20 years has been reduced significantly through the carrier testing programs that were implemented. But I've digressed quite a bit from the story that we began with, those two beautiful girls and the cheeky little brother. This picture is my favourite picture of Isla and Mia of all time because they're admiring a little baby ladybird there in Isla's hand and... It just captures the innocence of childhood for me and gives me a glimpse of what might have been. Six years on, Isla and Jude are now eight and ten and there's no denying that San Filippo has tightened its grip on them. The gap between them and their peers is gaping and it widens every day and the runway of time that we have to do something to help them is, is disappearing rapidly. Isla in particular has declined significantly over the last few months. She looks at me now with increasing distress and confusion and fear like anybody with dementia. She doesn't understand what's happening to her. Last Christmas I gave her a pile of presents and one of the things that's very Isla is that she loves to tear paper off her her presence and it doesn't matter what's inside. Sometimes we give her the same present twice, she doesn't notice. She just likes to open the present. 119 days later on her 10th birthday, I gave her her presents and she looked at me with a blank look of bewilderment. She didn't know what to do. 119 days. And Mia? We're not sure why, but Mia's battle with childhood dementia was swifter than Isla and Jude's. 
We hope one day science will have the answers for this and many more questions. In the end, Battens stole me as mind, her body and her voice. But right up until the last moment, she still had an incredible ability to connect and bring love, laughter and joy to everybody that crossed her path. She brought, touched more lives in her nine short years than most of us would if we had a hundred lifetimes and her memory will live on. Mia, Isla and Jude are the reason I keep fighting. They may have lost or are losing their voices, but I haven't lost mine. And this is an incredible time to be involved in the science and research fields. The pace of technology and progress is unprecedented. Genomics, gene therapy, gene editing, stem cell therapies, artificial intelligence, it is all happening. And it is absolutely realistic to think with continued focus on research into these disorders, within our lifetime, we will see many more of these rare childhood dementias with treatments, maybe even cures. And little girls like Isla and Mia can grow up to have those uneventful childhoods that they were supposed to. Thank you. <laughs>